You guys, Christmas is coming. I have the I have the twinkle mug out. Twinkle twinkle, everyone. Joyeux Noël. And last night I noticed all the Christmas lights are up, but it's raining and there are still fall leaves on the trees. It's a very confusing time of year to me. <laughs> And I feel like Halloween just happened. All the build up to Halloween and all the spooky books. I haven't even gotten to some of the spooky books that I wanted to read, so I'm feeling very confused about <laughs> my reading life. Hi everyone, it's me, Jess. I have a bit of a glare bouncing off my glasses today. It's quite a gray day and so I had to find the lightest room which is my front room that gets the most light. Let's talk about some of the books that I read in October. I definitely have mixed feelings about most of the books that I read in October. There are three that really stand out to me as being really Great. I'm going to talk about those three at the end of the video. The first I'll talk about are The Rabbit Hutch and Rabbits and Camp Zero. So Camp Zero, so these are the three books and Camp Zero which I had taken out of the library. These are the three books that I read in the reading vlog that I filmed this month. So if you're interested in checking that out I'll leave it linked in the description box below. Unfortunately Camp Zero lost me. It's not usual for me to DNF books but I just couldn't carry on reading Camp Zero. It had a great premise. premise was that it, it was set in northern Canada at this place called Camp Zero. It was a story that was told from different points of view. One point of view was this woman, Rose, who was working as an escort at this camp and had worked as an escort previous to arriving at the camp. It's gotten to the point where because of climate change, it's become more difficult to live, the world is heating up, it's become more difficult to live in the south of the world. We follow this character Rose who is an escort and this other character, I think his name was Grant, he was from a, a wealthy family and he's come to Camp Zero to teach the workers. So there are predominantly men working I guess in construction but they seem to be, it's not clear what they're making exactly. I guess the facility. This was a strange book. Yeah and then there's another story about a group of women who are climate scientists who are at a base up north and they're doing climate research and hello. And I guess for me what happened was it just I kept reading and I kept reading there was a lot of backstory on these different characters but they weren't coming together there wasn't that much happening. We got the idea that Rose was some kind of a spy, but she was supposed to be spying on the billionaire. So this is a billionaire who set up this Camp Zero. But for me, it just, the stories were not connecting soon enough in the book. I think I read all the way up to like maybe a hundred pages or more. And I, I just lost, I lost my interest in the book and I lost Kind of patience with it because it wasn't taking me anywhere. I do think that that book was over hyped and I guess if you've read Camp Zero and you really enjoyed it and you think I should give it another chance maybe leave a comment in the comment section below but for me it just really lost my attention and then because it was from the library somebody said in my comments at one point when I was discussing DNFing and I think it's a really fair point is that you know what you're DNFing a book if it's time for it to be returned to the library and you're like yeah, okay I will return it I don't need to renew it or I don't want to renew it necessarily. So that was really interesting to me and I thought it was a really interesting way to think about DNFing books in that you could imagine that the book was not yours and that you had to return it and would you want to keep it and would you want to keep reading it. So I thought that was really interesting. The other two books that I read in that blog I also read Rabbits by Terry Miles, which I really did enjoy. I thought it was a fun, fast-paced read. It did get a little overly complex, but I think that was the point. It reads like you're in a video game. So Rabbits is this video game that takes place in the real world. So it's the blurring of the line between reality and video games. And 
I talk about it a lot in the vlog, so I guess I'll just <laughs> send you over to watch that vlog if you want to know more about this book, but it's a mystery. You've got to figure out what's happening in the game very early on in the story. Our main character, Kay, is approached by one of the big winners of the rabbits game, which has been going on year after 11 iterations, and says to him, you know, you have to save, you have to find something to save the game. The game has gone off the rails and you have to figure it out. So therefore, you're really spending the whole time in this book with the main character trying to figure it out. And the added bonus is that people are dying People are starting to die and it feels very life and death his his challenge so it's very much like being in a video game and I thought it was thoroughly entertaining and enjoyable I really liked it the rabbit hatch which was a very weird book very strange book I thought it was dystopian I guess it's dystopian-esque it's about a woman who is living in a, a building with some other tenants and it just I don't know. I talked about it in the vlog and I thought it was had a lot of potential to be really really good but at the end of it it, it kind of really lost me. It didn't lose me because I ended up finishing reading it but it was strange. It was a very strange book and it was a weird reading experience so I don't know. In this book we're following Blandine and she's living in this apartment complex called the Rabbit Hutch <laughs> with some other characters and she pa crosses paths with these other characters in some instances and in weird ways which I thought was interesting and in some cases she doesn't so sometimes the stories of the other characters feel a little bit fragmented or disconnected and it takes place over one week and it ends in this really violent way that I that I wasn't expecting. I guess I knew that it was it was hinted at at the beginning of the book so I knew that something like that was coming but this was a really strange book and I still I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> I don't know if I would recommend it. For me I think it needed better editing and it needed to be a little bit more succinct but that was just my experience of reading it. But I mean I'm glad I read it though at the same time I do think there were some interesting things about it. So yeah go ahead and watch my vlog if you want to see more about those two books and my experience of reading them. I had a pretty good reading month actually. I got I did read a lot of books this month. I find in the months where I have a reading vlog I tend to read more. For my book club we read The Fraud by Zadie Smith. We had a lot to talk about. It was a good book club book, but we all had problems with The Fraud. We all had difficulty with it, as I think a lot of people have probably mentioned already. I appreciated this book. I really did appreciate this book. I felt like it had a lot of, it made a lot of commentary on a variety of different topics which I'll get to in just a moment. And I really liked the character of Mrs. Touche, Mrs. Touchette, I don't know which way to pronounce her name, who is really the protagonist of the story. The problem with the story, which I think Scott pointed out when he reviewed this book, and I think he's 100% right, the problem with this book is that it doesn't tell a story very well and I've run into this problem with Zadie Smith before. I really enjoyed White Teeth but I, I struggled with Northwest or NW. I really struggled with that one. Yeah, I have really mixed feelings about Zadie Smith. I think she's very talented. I think she's very skilled. Let me just get into what the story is about. The fraud is really three different narratives that are mashed together. They're smashed together is the best way I can put it. The first follows Mrs. Touchette and she is, she's a housemaid and she's married into, she's tied into this relationship with the novelist William Ainsworth through her marriage. We kind of follow her life as a woman in 19th century England as a woman of certain class at a certain time who in some ways is very progressive in her thinking. When we get her perspective and we're in her head, she is really annoyed at the people around her and their points of view being really ignorant or unsympathetic. 
And so I really related to her character. I think she was written in a way for us to be able to relate to her. So I really like the character of Mrs. Touchette. And I really wanted more from her story. I mean, there was a lot to her story. And there were some very poignant moments in this book between Mrs. Touche, Mrs. Touchette. I think I'm just going to call her Mrs. Touchette for the sake of the review. There were some really poignant moments. There was one moment that came near the end of the book between Mrs. Touchette and... Andrew Bogle, which is another character's storyline, one of the ones that's mashed together. There were moments in this book that I really was really rooting for it. I thought, wow, this is great. This is such a good moment. They're reflective of these conversations about slavery, hypocrisy. So slavery, hypocrisy, let me just reel it back a little bit. So the three narratives are the narrative of Mrs. Uh, Touchette and the narrative of, as I just mentioned, Andrew Bogle, who comes to us later in the story, much later in the story, because he is tied up with the third narrative, which is the story of the Tichborne trial, which was a big, massive trial in the UK that people were completely obsessed with. And so Andrew Bogle is a witness in the Tichborne trial, and Mrs. Touche is an obsessed observer of the Tichborne trial, and that's how it all comes together. But the Tichborne trial itself, about a man who claimed to be the long-lost heir to the Tichborne family fortune. I think that Smith was exploring a lot of different ideas that can be viewed as contemporary issues that are with us still today. And in that way, I found the book really interesting. So the spectacle of the trial itself, the way a trial becomes something way beyond <laughs> what it's intended to be, which is to prove or disprove the facts of the case. It becomes sensational, it becomes exaggerated, and that the lawyers that are presenting the case become these characters and celebrities in their own right and lie and present false ideas and manipulate the public and how the public's influence on a case. I thought that that was really interesting. It reminded me so much of the Johnny Depp case and various different public fascination, very different cases where there's been a ton of public interest and public fascination. And then of course she's looking at the really deeply entrenched uh, inequalities and inequities in society between women and men uh, of different social standing, Mrs. Touche herself, and also the idea of the fraud, not just the fraud as in the character in the case, he's referred to as a claimant in the case, is potentially fraudulent claim as being this heir. But also she looks at famous characters in society, in particular Charles Dickens, and their hypocrisy and their, their fraudulent representation of themselves as philanthropists or as being a benefactor or being advocating for the poor, for example, like Charles Dickens but the hypocrisy of that because they are wealthy and they're living in comfort. She writes about the famous abolitionist William Wilberforce who is living comfortably on his family's sugar fortune. And I think that that translates very well into modern day society when we're thinking about arguing with somebody in social media about what role they play when they have privilege, myself included. But this is really expressed through Mrs. Touche exasperation with these different characters in society and the way that the characters are presented. And then, as I said, there's this really poignant moment between Andrew Bogle and Mrs. Touche, where even Mrs. Touche herself is not able to... So there's this whole exploration of being a fraud and the face that you choose to show to the world maybe is very different from your true self. That's an interesting topic. The trial and the spectacle of a trial and the way that that captured the public's imagination and the way that that can distort the actual tr trial itself is really interesting and very timely. And also the dynamics between people who claim to be progressive or be are hypocritical in the sense that they continue to live off the wealth of <laughs> the, sl the slaves and there's no 
recognition of that or acknowledgement of that. I think those are the things that I really took away from the story. And I do think that Mrs. Touche really tries. She does try in her own way. She has an inheritance that she refuses to accept and chooses to give away how meaningful that decision is and how actually impactful that decision is, is kind of questionable. But at the same time, I think that she kind of is like a, a representation of this idea of trying to, to overcome that inequity or that dynamic in, a, in one's personal life in a very honest and meaningful way. And that's why I thought she was a really interesting character and I really appreciated her. But I do think that the criticisms of the fraud are fair because it just doesn't really have a lot of forward momentum. It doesn't have a narrative that really pulls you forward. It's very, it has this, I think that she wrote it, I think, and I'm not maybe the only one to think this, but I think that she wrote it as a presentation of a story kind of in the same way that you might have had the presentation of a lot of the works of that time, like all of Charles Dickens stories being presented episode by episode, chapter by chapter, published once a month or once every couple of weeks or once a week. And so I think maybe she was trying to do that in a sense. I'd have to think about it a little further. So mixed feelings about the fraud. I would say for me overall, I actually enjoyed it and I'm glad I stuck with it, but I do understand all of the criticisms of it. And I just, I think it's because of the two characters, Andrew Bogle and Mrs. Touchette, were both really characters that I could easily sympathize with. And their interactions were the most interesting parts of the book for me. So that's The Fraud by Sadie Smith. The next book I'm going to talk about is Freshwater for Flowers by Valérie Perrin. Now this was the book for Scott's book club, which he's recently started through his Patreon. I'm going to leave the information linked in the description box below. I don't want anyone to come at me. <laughs> Almost everyone. So we had a book club meeting about this book and everyone, well, not maybe not everyone enjoyed it. I, I don't recall everyone's opinions, but I think I was the only one who came in saying this. But I said off the bat that if I was reading this, I probably would have DNF'd it. I think this is a reflection of my reading taste more than anything else. I found this book to be fairly commercial. And the message of this book, although very heartwarming, I just found I don't know, I just had a lot of difficulty with it. By 100 pages in, I would have put it down because I found it was beginning to be fairly repetitive and I had gotten the basic gist and idea of the main character and the book, even though I didn't know anything about the plot, which came later. And I will say that when those plot points were introduced in the story. I was more interested, so I wavered back and forth between being more interested in the plot later and less interested further on. So it does make me question again the idea of DNFing a book. But at the end of the day, sorry, I should be holding the book up. I will say that this book wasn't for me. And I think it's just because I just didn't find it to be realistic or something. People are gonna disagree with me and that's totally fine. The message of this book is, I love life as long as it's shared with other people, even though bad things happen in life. And I love the beauty of life. And those are very nice messages, but I, it wasn't really what I was expecting coming into it. I found it to be a little bit corny, sorry. A little bit cheesy at times. Our main character Violette in the story is a cemetery caretaker and it tells her life story and it also tells a lot of the stories of a lot of the people whose graves are in the cemetery and there's a little bit of mystery involved in the book. I thought it would be darker. I just thought cemetery caretaker, this is going to be dark. This is going to be a little bit gothic. This is going to be, you have this protagonist who's a cemetery caretaker and in her previous life, she was a crossing guard. And I'm not going to give anything away from the plot of the story, but she's had a very hard life. She's experienced a lot of difficulties in her life. It's a little bit this idea of Oh, even with having experienced all these difficulties in life, she still finds the good. And I just can't relate to that idea. I find it very difficult to relate to that idea. I think the other thing that bothered me a lot about the book is that it's very long. It's too long. It's got a lot of superfluous, flowery descriptions and imagery and a lot of funeral speeches. <laughs> it's a bit repetitive. It's written like a diary entries. It's sort of written in a couple of different genres, interspersing epigraphs and maybe even a little bit of a, an autobiograph an autobiographical style. There were a lot of other characters in the book. And even though the story involves a lot of tragedy, I found that there was very little that was 
implied in this book and a very little that was suspenseful for me in this book and everything felt explained in a certain way to the reader or direct to the reader. So yeah, it does have the appeal of secret lives and betrayals and a character who hides elements of herself. It's interesting, she wears dark clothes over colorful clothes at the cemetery. So there's this idea of, of hiding parts of herself, with I, which I thought was a little bit interesting. But yeah, other than that, there's some romance in this book, which might be appealing. It leaves a message of woman's capacity to accept things in life's experience and maybe an unrecognized or sometimes not acknowledged capacity to rebuild one's life and to rebuild oneself. I think that that was interesting, but ultimately I found this book to be way too commercial, far too long, and far too, and kind of unoriginal in the writing. And it's funny because a lot of people think that the writing is really beautiful, and I know that this might be an unpopular opinion, so I'm sorry. I'll come for me. <laughs> This just wasn't a book for me at the end of the day. And it's so funny because the next book that I'm going to talk about, which I loved, loved, has had similar criticism. So it just depends on, I think it just depends on how you approach a book and what you think is original. Like so much of this is subjective. I just want to remind everyone. And just because I didn't like a book doesn't mean it's not a good book. However, I loved this book. I read this book with Lori, Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. This was long listed for the Women's Prize. It is a very simple book. I've heard it being criticized as being too commercial or too simple or that the writing is, is cheesy. It's funny, one of the passages that I marked that I actually liked, I noticed on Goodreads in one of the reviews somebody pointed out that it, that was a cheesy line, but I'm going to read it to you because I think it's a great line. Actually, I'll read it to you in a minute. I'll just give you a little synopsis. This is the story of Zora. Zora is the protagonist in the story. She is a middle-aged woman who is a teacher in Sarajevo, and she makes the decision to stay behind and keep watch over her mom's apartment while her husband takes her mother to the UK where her daughter is living because she's remarried. He takes her there to, to get away from what seems to be the beginnings of some bad <laughs> conflicts that ends up of course turning into the war. And I just love this book. I mean there were so many things that we talked about. Lori and I when we buddy read this book together we talked a lot about this idea of when you make a decision like that, when you make the decision to stay behind you maybe don't realize the consequences of the decision and I think that that was very well established that Zora didn't realize what was coming and that many times in a situation of war things can escalate very quickly without you really realizing how bad it is and at the same time you're in denial that what's happening is as dangerous as it is or could even be happening like it's hard for the brain to even accept or process what's happening. So I think there's a lot of that it was really I thought it was really well represented here with Zora's character and that decision to stay was a big part of our conversation in the first part of our reading of the book. And then you stay for, you know, you stay because you have a duty or responsibility in Zora's case to protect her mother's apartment. You stay because you don't understand what the consequences necessarily are staying. You don't think it'll be difficult for you to leave at a certain point later. You stay because it's your home. It's your homeland. It's there are so many reasons why you would stay and there are different reasons for the different characters staying and I thought that was really interesting. She ends up really befriending her neighbors and we hear about the neighbors, their points of view on staying and leaving and even this comes up at various points throughout the book as different events happen in the unfolding of the conflict. The other thing that I thought was really beautiful about this book is the way that art is represented. Azora is an artist and she's an art teacher. She ends up, well her home Sarajevo and her her home land is a big inspiration for her art, in particular bridges. The bridge that ends up getting destroyed, I've forgotten the name of the bridge. The bridge that ends up getting destroyed in this conflict is an inspiration for her early art and was really what made her career 
the painting of these different interpretations of these bridges and then later on her art becomes more reflective of the experience of war. Oh this is just, just a beautiful book. There are so many things to think about. I'm not going to tell you how it ends it, and if I told you how it ends I would talk for another 10 or 15 minutes because there's so much to talk about in terms of the ending of this book and the impact that war has on individuals but I will leave it there. I will say that if you haven't picked up Black Butterflies. I really think it's worthwhile. It would be an excellent book club book. I loved it. I really loved it. So let me just read you the passage that someone else thought was extremely commercial and cheesy and that I thought was wonderful. Her writing is very simple but I think it's very effective. So this is very at the very beginning of the book. So she's in a confrontation with some hoodlums who have broken into her mother's apartment which is uh, it's abandoned. They think that they could take it over. She writes, a cool needle of alarm slid into Zora's belly. She, but she reminded herself her mother's neighbor had always overreacted and thought the worst of everyone. So that line, a cool needle of alarm slid into Zora's belly, I thought was great. Someone else thought it was terrible. Just goes to show. And then the title of the book comes, I thought this was very poetic, but some people might think it's really cheesy. The title of the book, Black Butterflies, comes from what happens to... So her neighbor, Mirsad, is a bookshop owner. And so there's a focus also on literature as well as art in the story. There are many fires as you have when there are bombing campaigns and Black Butterflies is, it refers to the burnt fragments of poetry and art catching in people's hair after one of these fires. Like I'm already tearing up because I find it really sad. So I love this book. I thought it was wonderful and I'll be curious to see what other people think mm. if you've read it. So yeah, this might be going on my best of this year. I'm so glad I got to it finally finally got to it. And then the last two books I'm going to talk about are witchy spooky books. I only got to two of them. I'm still reading two other ones for spooky season. First is Wayward by Amelia Hart. I have kind of mixed feelings about this book. I think ultimately I enjoyed it. It follows the narrative of three different women in three different time periods. One is a modern day and they're all related. They all have uh, there's a lineage that connects them all through Wayward, which is the Wayward Women, and it's related to witches and witchery and basically women's power. So women who presented themselves in ways where they tried to take their own power. Each different character did this in different ways in the different eras. So you have uh, Kate, who is a modern day protagonist, who is trying to escape an abusive relationship. You have Altha in 1619 who has been accused of witchcraft and murdering one of the... She's been accused of sorcery basically <laughs> that has led to murder. So it's about her trial and it's about the result of her trial. And then in 1942 you have Violet who is kind of trapped on her family's estate. She ends up in a bad situation, pregnant, and she decides to... She takes it upon herself to take care of her pregnancy on her own. I'm trying not to give too many details away. The only thing that I had difficulty with with the book is that I do find that the men in the book are characterized in extremely negative ways except for in the one case the one of the fathers is a good character but it's a pretty good book. I really enjoyed it. It's Australian so it was a choice for Straya September and then ended up being read over October and it's very witchy. So she does a really good job of weaving this stories together. It's very cohesive. It makes sense. There are a lot of really good reveals in this book and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Maybe not a five-star read but I really thought it was well written and well crafted. Like I said just the male characters in the story are there. there's too many bad male characters that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable or at least it made me feel a little bit more uncomfortable about just Sometimes when you read these very feminist books that are witchy and that are very feminist and then it's really just like men are evil and although I understand that and I accept that to a certain degree I also think that I think that it could have been treated a little bit more. That was it just got to me. Let's just put it that way. It just got to me. And then one of my favorite books also this year, surprise surprise, this is my second Stephen Graham Jones this year. The Only Good Indians. I just finished reading this very recently and it was fantastic. I heard nothing but amazing things about it but it's so good. If you like horror, and there is horror, there's gore, if you like horror this is such a good book. This is about an elk 
that takes revenge on her hunters. A mother elk, yes, <laughs> who takes revenge on her hunters and it is just amazing. I loved it so much. It's also a really wonderful book because Stephen Graham Jones uses his narrative also as a way of telling stories of Indian experiences. And I really appreciated that as well. One of the scenes takes place in a sweat lodge because they're doing a sweat to acknowledge a death. So it's about these four, it's about these four men, these four friends who on Thanksgiving went out hunting. One of the elk that they hunted and killed gets her revenge. That's basically, it's a revenge story. What I, I just appreciate his writing so much. He's really good at creating suspense. He's really good at giving you a twist here and a turn there that you weren't expecting. He's really good at crafting characters. I was really invested in the characters. It was really good. I can't, I don't know, I can't really rave enough about it. It was so good. And I, I just love his work. And it's great. I'm so happy I went back to it because like I've said before, I've read my Heart is a Chainsaw, which now I feel like I want to reread and read that trilogy that he's just put out because I found it a bit complicated, but now I feel like maybe I would do better with his writing. I'm not sure. This was so good. If you haven't read it and you're looking for a horror book, this is like best, one of the best horror books I've ever read. So good. So that's it. That's my wrap up for October. Thanks everyone for watching. I appreciate you so much if you made it to the end of the video. And yes, this was quite a long video. <laughs> So if you were able to stick with me to the end of this video, please leave me an emoji from one of my two favorite books that I read in October. It could be a butterfly or it could be a deer, an elk, a deer. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. It's different from what I thought it was going to be. I'm sorry, there are children screaming outside. It's super distracting. Touche. Touchette, Mrs. Touche's, you have to stop biting my hand. You have to stop. No. Are you done? Are you done? Demanding of attention. The demanding of attention. Hey, excuse me. I'm trying to film a video here. I think it's so hard.